We can win this war. We can win this war? OK, well, joining us from Orlando, Florida, is the man in that clip, Anthony Dream Johnson, who says he wants to abolish feminism and make women great again. No, but it also crazy. says, with a trademark, make women great again. Full women always, always great. great. Right. Make women great again. But they're going to do a three-day seminar for women led by all men. <laughs> in mansplaining news, a three-day conference for women led by men hopes to make women great again. How the 22 convention will make you the greatest you ever. Raise your femininity by 500%. First of all, how is a man supposed to tell a woman how to be the ultimate woman? Well, women need to be taught how to be great again. Oh, not my yes, words. We do. Like how to land a husband, <gasps> how to lose weight, how to pop out a bunch of kids. Why do men think they need to fix the problems of women? Well, it says the world's ultimate event for women. Yeah, Orlando, Florida, that's going to be the scene of the crime. It's mansplaining palooza and say no to the toxic, bullying, feminist dogma. <laughs> Taught by men to make women great again. Taking the stage now is the founder of the 22 Convention. You're in for a treat, Mr. Anthony Dream Johnson. Anthony Dream Johnson. Anthony Dream Johnson. The first president of the Manosphere. It's run by all men, Surprise. which promises to, quote, make women great again. This course is guaranteed to raise your femininity by 500%. Together, we will make women great again. Excuse me, I'm mansplaining here. She said there's nothing wrong. Howdy, everyone. I'm here to introduce Anthony the Dream Johnson. Woo. What's his dream? Fairness and justice for men and women. A, a good society. But Anthony is, he's not just a man who has goals like that. He's a friend of mine. And I don't have many friends. Only five friends. People that I have deeply shared values. Anthony has a deep commitment to rationality, to pursuing honorable goals by worthy means, and it's truly a pleasure and an honor for me to introduce him to you, Anthony Jones. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. Howdy, Pam. I'm back. I talked to you guys a little bit at 21 Summit, you know, just yesterday. This is going to be my keynote address to the ladies of the 22 Convention. A couple guys here as well, a couple non-birthing persons. So I appreciate y'all showing up, enjoying the event, and experiencing what, like he said, uh, my dream. One of my dreams was, and currently is, making women great again. We're gonna look into that now. This speech today, actually, in my keynote here now, this is the first time I'm gonna do a comprehensive overview of what Make Women Great Again really is on video. In the previous two years, and we'll look at it in just a moment, I gave much more specific talks. In 2020, we'll see in a minute, I gave a talk on motherhood, and last year in 2021, I gave a talk on making women virgins again. Hats in the back, of course, on sale, 30 bucks. Pick one up. So let's get into it. And this is actually, too, I'm working on a book of the same title. So Make a Woman Great Again. This is the uh, a simplified you know, overview of that, a comprehensive overview. The book, it's still in the early phases, but it should be coming out next year. Fingers crossed, we'll see how that goes. So for those of you who don't know, Make Women Great Again, when it launched uh, like on the last two days of 2019, basically early 2020, it went viral. It was the first thing we'd ever done in terms of going viral in the media with my company in like 14, 15 years at that point. We had a couple of news sources that had looked at what we'd done before that, a couple of interviews, but this was massive. It hit the New York Times, the New York Post. Uh, I did a 20 minute interview on TV with Piers Morgan, uh, Blaze TV, Sky News, it hit everything. We actually counted all the uh, people that it, it uh, hit on the internet, basically, and it was somewhere between 100 and 150 million. You know, if it's on Twitter, a bunch of those by bots, but outside of that, it's still millions and millions of people. And that happened right before COVID hit. So January and February, the media was obsessed with this, naturally, and it was hilarious, and it was a big learning experience for life. I never had that many haters before at one time. I'm used to getting a lot of hate, a lot of controversy and shit like that, but this was particularly like massive and it was so much fun. Since then, we still get a lot of heat uh, from the media. So every, basically every like three to six months, there'll be like some blog or news outlet or podcast that has a big hissy fit about what we're doing. 
This year, actually, they've been obsessed. It's a lot of Christians, actually, Christian feminists, which I think is like a contradiction and uh, you know a bunch of BS. I had a timer. Okay. Yeah, thanks. So they've been actually after the Patriarch Convention a lot, but also this event, Make Women Great Again, uh, particularly this pastor, Brian Save, he'll be speaking to you tomorrow. He spoke to our fathers uh, just yesterday. They did a whole kind of hit piece on it, and then also was accused of murdering women. So I woke up one day a few months ago, and it's from the banter, uh, some blog, and it used to be an even bigger magazine, I think, a couple years ago, and they restructured it. So I woke up one day, and I'm used to getting like, a lot of accusations, pretty wild stuff, even like death threats, crap like that. I've even had death threats against my family, uh, immediate and extended, for doing what I do. Most of those are just people mouthing off on the internet. I did get some one at my house one time, like in the mailbox, which was pretty sketch. Anyway, the title of this headline of this news outlet, you know, bitching about me, the right's misogyny is worse than you think, and it's killing women. Uh, and then this, you know, the subtitle, Republicans are openly and eagerly talking about forcing women to die from pregnancy, which I've never said, I've never done any of that. That's the kind of how fake news works, right? You get this super, super intense headline, even more bombastic than I would be, which I think is saying a lot. And they kind of, you know, loosely accuse you of like killing women. I've never killed any women, not that I know of. I have no intent to kill women. I like women a lot. I have a girlfriend. I have a mother. I have a couple sisters. I have a niece on the way in a few months. So I love women a lot, you know? We'll see. But anyway, they bitched about me, and then they bitched about 22 Convention. And then even Make Women Great Again and some of the other speakers you saw, like Pastor Michael Foster. So this happens every few months, and it's not quite as massive as this, but it's kind of this ongoing train where they just keep, you know, it's clicks for them, basically. It's drama. It's hilarious, too. So like I mentioned, in 2020, my first speech here is about motherhood first. Uh, kind of like America first and politics, right? Motherhood first. Hashtag motherhood first. That was my speech in 2020. You can go on 21 University or on YouTube. Type motherhood first that you pull right up. It's about an hour long, and it's about women putting motherhood first, prioritizing motherhood and putting it first before schooling and be advanced schooling, college and stuff, and before a career. Today in America, women are basically taught by feminism to put motherhood last. They don't ever put it in those words because it's too explicit. It would reveal the lie, it would reveal the manipulation. But fundamentally, that's what they do. They want women to put motherhood last till they're like 35, when they have an advanced geriatric pregnancy, and all that kind of stuff. The chances of birth defects go up for the child. Chances of problems when uh, during pregnancy go way up. The, the chances of problems during pregnant or uh, childbirth go way up. So this is basically a rejection of all that feminist dogma, that fe feminist bullshit, putting motherhood first where it should be, where biology, in my view, demands it. A woman's fertility drops off a cliff at about 30, then again at 35, up to about 40. So nature wants you to get pregnant and have babies as young as you can for your own health and even the health of your children. This is, in my speech, is a total refutation of what feminism, feminism teaches women today. So check it out, and we're gonna dig into a little more here too. And fundamentally, you could wrap up that speech with make motherhood great again. Women should value motherhood, they should pursue motherhood first in most cases. We live in a free country, and when you have hundreds of millions of women making choices, you're always gonna have some that don't. But this has been normal for a long, long time in our species, and it's not now. Having your first kid at 38 years old or freezing your eggs and all this weird shit, this is not normal. You know, feminism and mainstream culture, they want women to think this is normal. It's not normal. You live in a radical, you know, feminist time. We live in basically a matriarchy that's spelled patriarchy. It's a lie. So put motherhood first, make motherhood great again. My speech last year was a little different, but also much more specific, right, that we're gonna get into today. And that's make women virgins again. And this was a speech last year, you can check it out. This came out actually about a month ago on YouTube and 21 University. And it's about prioritizing virginity and actually valuing it again in our culture. I think in the past 20 to 30 years, virginity for women in particular, never mind in even a uh, broader scale, this for women has just gone out the window. I think all the way up to maybe the 80s, this was still kind of a thing. And the 90s and 2000s and beyond, it's just gone out the window. Most girls are having sex by 15, 16 years old at this point, if not even earlier. So this is a whole speech on those issues and how women should prioritize virginity and not just throw it out the window, you know, willy-nilly. Bad idea. Keep that shit as long as you can. Uh, this didn't show up too right. Anyway, this is a picture. Of one of the inspirations for my speeches is my grandmother on my mom's side. This is actually a picture. I don't know why it came out fuzzy like that. I'm not sure. But anyway, it's a picture of my grandma, my grandpa, my uncle, my aunt. 
My grandma I've spoken about previously in my speeches, so I thought I would show, even though it's a little pixelated. Uh, she was the greatest woman I ever knew. She died about in 2011, it's about you know, 11 years ago now. But she's inspired a lot of what I talk about in these speeches as a model for how women should behave. And fundamentally, make women great again, if women don't figure this out watching our video or in the, in the media and stuff. Yeah, women I think were better when they were you know, a long time ago. And this has gone downhill over the decades and over the past century, at least. My grandma got married at 16 and then got pregnant with my uncle, you see on the right, um, Uncle Johnny, when she was only 16 years old. That's pretty young. Back then it was normal. And even if that's not normal again in the immediate or distant future, something in that direction is a lot healthier and more normal than like being 38 years old, having your first kid, you know, going through 20, 30, 40 guys, and then settling down with some beta when you're like 40. This kind of model of behavior is delusional. Feminism teaches women that this is normal. It is not normal. This, you know, her marrying my uh, grandpa at 16, that's pretty young. But in America, it's still legal in a bunch of states. And I think anything in that direction is a lot healthier and normal for children and for women and for building a better country and a better future. So I just kind of wanted to show that to you guys. I just hear the laughs as I'm like drinking water. So one of the most important elements of making women great again is making mansplaining great again. The first 22 convention, as you probably know at this point, maybe heard in the websites and stuff like that, we called it the mansplaining event of the century because I forbid any women from talking to women about becoming great again. It was only men. It was actually kind of a trick because at the last minute I had Jennifer Molesky speak. I just figured she'd be a good speaker. I was like, you know what, let's just do it. And then in the future, I knew anyway I wanted to add more women, like Melissa Isaac, like Suzanne Benker, like Jennifer Molesky, and others, too. Elliot Hulse's wife, for example, spoke last year, Colleen Hulse, at our event. Really good job. Millions of views on the videos. To make mansplaining great again, first of all, men need to speak up more. So this is men speaking up more and more and more and rejecting any kind of shaming language or guilt tripping and crap like this. These accusations of toxic masculinity and all this bullshit. I say I'm 100% toxic. My masculinity is extremely fucking toxic. And if you don't like it, you can eat shit and suck my balls. <laughs> now, on top of that, women need to listen, right? If men just speak, even if they're bold and brash, and they even care, even if they're sincere, right? And fundamentally, a little tangent, but ultimately, most of fatherhood is mansplaining, right? A lot of speakers you've seen here are fathers at this event leading up to this point in the speaking air. A father teaching his young daughter how to be a woman, how to be a good woman, this fundamentally is mansplaining. And when they accuse men of mansplaining on TV and in magazines and on the news and all this crap, ultimately a lot of that, just, it comes down to not just culture-wide silencing men and suppressing male voices, suppressing masculinity. It's even an attack on fatherhood. But it's covert and it's multi-layered and it's hard to understand that. It's hard to detect at a quick glance. But men need to speak up more, like we're doing at this convention, that is mostly men still speaking at it. And on top of that, women need to listen. If you have a father who's even remotely good father, listen. And then, you know, take the advice and do what you can with it. None of this boss bitch, I'm a feminist boss queen. I actually get banned, I get uh, blocked by feminists a lot on Twitter when I just call them a feminist boss queen. Jordan Peterson's daughter blocked me a couple weeks ago just for calling her a feminist boss queen, right? I wasn't cursing, it wasn't like even, it wasn't even a meme. I have some memes of her. But anyway, feminist boss queen shit is not healthy. It's not good for you. Don't do it. Listen. What you end up doing with it is up to you, but at least listen and do it sincerely. And men, speak up. Be bold. We need to make women feminine again. We'll get in a second. But women in this country don't act like women anymore. When I went to Poland for my first time, I've been to Europe many times with this convention. We've had our men's convention, uh, 21 convention, back in 2010 in Sweden. We had it in London in 2011 and 2012, and we in Australia even in 2012, or in 2012 as well. A bunch of events around the world back then. And I got to see different cultures, how men and women operate and stuff like that when I was there, usually for two to like six weeks at a time. So it wasn't like, you know, a year at a time, but I got a good taste of the culture. Poland was different. Uh, we went to Poland, we had the 21 convention in 2019 in Warsaw. And I spent about two months, uh, or a little bit over a month, yeah, in that country in 2019, uh, scouting it and then doing our event there later. And I was amazed at how women and men acted in that country. The men acted like men and the women acted like women. And I will never forget seeing that in a modern, you know, civilized country like Poland. It's different. You see a little bit of this in South America and stuff, but in Poland, it felt like America, 
first world country, nice and clean, super cool shit, I love those people. But the women act completely different at a scale I've never seen. Nowhere in America, nowhere in Canada, nowhere in Australia, nowhere in Britain. In Poland, women acted like women. Everywhere you went, airport, coffee shop, hotel, whatever. And that blew me away that to see that many women act that consistently, and the men too, right? You could even feel this kind of tension, like the women act, expected men to act like men, and the men expected women to act like women. Basically, their gender roles are still intact in Poland. I think because communism is so, in Poland, basically, they fucking hate communism. I mean, with a burning passion, because the Soviets came in and controlled the country for a long time. And I think because of that hatred of uh, communism on a political scale, any sense of it culturally, they're super, super averse to, they just hate it. And because of that, feminism has taken a much slower route there. They're worried about it, they're concerned about it, but the tolerance for it is lower. As a result, they have much more intact gender roles, much healthier, and it feels good. It feels good to be around it. I mean, as a man, I was single back then, just going there and seeing this women act like women just all around me. It was, it was wild, I'll never forget it. And it kind of reset my standards and expectations for what I even wanted from women in America. So it was a really good experience. So women need to be act feminine again. They don't need to act masculine. I hope this, this should be common sense. If you're a woman, act like a woman. If you're a man, act like a man. This is a good, simple way to live. It's worked for thousands of years. Now, only sluts instead of only fans. There's nothing on there but sluts. I mean, literally, if you go anywhere in America in any kind of sample size of people, and you have women, right? Millions of them or something, or thousands. It's always going to be a mixture of people, right? How they behave. On OnlyFans or Only Sluts, it's 100% sluts. If you found a not slut on there, I'd be stunned. So it's only sluts, or only thoughts, only skanks. Anyway, I went to college, for example, in the 2000s, 2006 to 2010 at UCF in Orlando. Back then, OnlyFans was still a long way off, right? Uh, seeking arrangement, sugar baby stuff was still really, really young. I didn't even hear about it at that point until many years later. So women now, particularly with only sluts, only fans, right? Other things too, kind of tender, kind of seeking arrangements, sugar baby stuff, but really I think it's just this thing that has normalized prostitution for women in America. Other countries as well, you know, it's internet things, so it's not just America, but primarily in America, it seems to have really taken off where women will monetize their sexuality. They're, there's hookers, basically. They're digital hookers or digital strippers. This has been normalized in America for millions of women. This is not feminine, at least it's the dark side of femininity. As a speaker like Pat Steadman, you guys will see at our event, we might call it. But this is not normal. You know, being in college in the two, late 2000s, I never thought that in the next couple of years, prostitution would just become completely normalized for millions of American women. Did not see that coming. And I think most Americans would, would, would agree with that. Like, what the fuck happened? Now, it's a free country. This is still going on. I'm not calling it for it to be canceled or anything like that. It is just bizarre, and this shit needs to stop. It needs to tone way, 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 way down. Exist, okay. Normal, not okay. One of the ways to look at this is actually from your next speaker, AJ Cortez speaks right after me. And in 2019, he uses a simple bell curve. He talked about sluts and good girls and virgins and stuff like this. And one of the explanations he gave, I'll never forget, is first of all, there's always been hoes and 304s, as Coach Greg might call it, right? And sluts and you know, promiscuous women, whatever, right? That's not new. The old saying is prostitution is the oldest uh, career in the world, right? For who knows how many thousands of years. That's not a bad thing, it just kind of is what it is. What's happened is the, the bottom end of the bell curve where you had your sluts and your whores and your 304s and all that shit, your scallywags, that has shifted into the middle of the bell curve. Like OnlyFans, this used to be a small minority of the population that would do this kind of stuff. Strippers, working girls, escorts, whatever. That has now moved into a huge chunk of the population. This is crazy. Like, it can be funny, we can laugh at it, we should laugh at it, but at the end of the day, it's really fucking sad, and it doesn't work. You gotta think 10, 20, 30, 40 years out. What does this do to your country? What does this do to families? What does this do to kids? What does this do to women? What does this do to men? This is a fucking, this whole thing combined with this is a disaster. And it's not just only, it's only sluts, I'm not even just picking on that. The whole culture has become ultra sexualized and the most bizarre, monetized, I'm gonna be a prostitute at 19 kind of way. How many 19 year old girls in America now, 18, 19, 20 years old, are literally hookers behind their parents' back, their boyfriends, you know, 
they've been out of husband that age because the whole culture is fucked up anyway. But this is just, this is a tidal wave of disaster and shit show in disguise. So it's funny to laugh at, but ultimately it's really sad. And yeah, this, this middle ground, it is what it is. You know, and it's shifting though from this is not healthy. This has to stop. So for the women watching here, in particular on the internet, when they're gonna go bananas, right? Bitching and complaining about what we post, get off the thought train. This WAP stuff from Cardi B and that whole culture of this garbage, it, feed, it leads to this, okay? This is your life, the cat kingdom, okay? You can be eating cat food, drinking BOGO dollar store wine, uh, while your brothers and sisters, hopefully, who did better than you and made better choices for themselves, more responsible, are not eating cat food and surrounded by a bunch of cat babies. I'm not even anti-cat. Uh, you know, people call me the cat daddy. I have like five cats I take care of in my neighborhood. They're not even mine, but they're kind of mine. So I'm not even anti-cat. I'm pro-cat, 100%. But this whole WAP culture, and you're just going to be a big boss queen, feminist skank, and then it's going to work out fine as a lie. It's always been a lie, and every year that goes by, it gets more and more apparent. And the cognitive dissonance results in this. When you can't run away from reality anymore, you're gonna eat fucking cat food or starve. And then they'll eat you when you're dead. They're gonna nibble on your toes. So don't, this is bad. It looks fun, they sell it, music videos, all the colors, right? You know, the rich and famous, all this garbage. This is misery in the making. Don't do this, it's terrible. So we gotta make women chaste again, basically. Don't be a slut, you know? You can do that, but choices have consequences. It's gonna fuck up your life. Don't do it. This is a much better model. It's a quick graph from my speech last year, but basically, women having too much sex with too many men ruins your life. Sex is good. I'm not anti-sex, I'm 100% pro-sex. Great sex, have a good fucking time. But you, women, in my view, should have as much sex as possible with as few men as possible. Ideally one, your husband. If not, as close as humanly possible. And if you violate that, if you say, oh, whatever, it's some guy on YouTube or some speaker, you're gonna learn the hard way. You're gonna end up like her. You're gonna go from that to that, and it's gonna suck. And you're gonna remember this dude in a red hat bitching out you to stop being a skank. You don't wanna listen, you're gonna learn. You can learn the easy way, or you can learn the hard way. We need to make women cook again. A lot of women today can't cook anymore. My grandma was dope. She would cook like the best food. I think women should cook. Cooking is great. Men can cook too, but mostly just grilling. I do like shakes and coffee for myself and then I grill. Everything else is kind of gay. But men should definitely, or women should definitely cook. Men can cook a few things. Women today, I think they really can't cook. They can't do almost anything. My grandma could sew, she could cook amazing food all the fucking time. We loved it as kids growing up, right? Women today on Tinder, these little Tinder thoughts, cannot even boil an egg. They can't even boil water. They don't even, they have no idea. So that to me is a disaster and it's funny, but it has real consequences for your dating life, for your relationships. Your boyfriend will expect you to cook. Your husband will expect you to cook. You want your kids to get fat and eat McDonald's? No, you need to feed them. You need to cook for them, right? Common sense, old school shit. We've got to make women cook again. Hat on sale in the back. We've got to make women thin again. I think this doesn't need too much uh, iteration, but a little bit at least. Obesity in America has skyrocketed for everyone, and especially women. It's actually higher for women by a little bit than even men. Severe obesity, morbidly obese, all this kind of stuff, and you know, diabetes, all the diseases of civilization. That's terrible. It's terrible for you. It's terrible for your family. It's terrible for your relationships. It's terrible for your work. It's terrible for your kids, birth defects, complications of pregnancy, stuff like that. So we've got to make women thin again. Now, I don't actually care too much about thinness. That's just meant to be offensive and polarizing. We should actually pursue his fitness and health. You should lift weights. You should eat healthy. You should respect the wisdom and the nature of your ancestors and how they ate. That doesn't mean you have to mimic them. We should definitely look into eating something along the lines of a paleo diet or a primal diet. We have a lot of speeches at 21 University and the former speakers at 21 Convention, Mark Sisson, Dr. Paul Jaminet, Dr. Doug McGuff, a lot of medical doctors and PhDs and famous authors that spoke about these issues and you should look into it. This changes, it's changed my life. I started eating paleo in 2008. One of my sisters, I got her to eat paleo when I moved back to Orlando in 2016. She lost 40 pounds in three months. And a cure, she had uh, PCOS, PSOX, I think how you say it. It's a problem that women can have and it's like really serious. She had multiple surgeries for it. I went to her doctors with her. They told her she was basically like doomed. It was never gonna go away. Cleared up in three months. 
That's not medical advice, disclaimer. But it was very frustrating talking to these doctors because I knew I could fix it for her in a few months, and then it did. And she was terrified of that, and she had pain, severe pain. She said way worse than like PMS stuff, or whatever you call it. And she had that since she was like a teenager. Fixed, boom. Might not do it for you, depending if you have it, who knows, but I can guarantee you, living in alignment to your DNA, living in alignment to your ancestors and what was inherited to you and by you, from what your parents and your ancestors that came before you is gonna make you live a better life. That's what being, you know, Jennifer Molesky asked me a couple years ago, what it meant to be a woman uh, on a podcast, you're doing like an interview. And I told her very simply, it's living in alignment to your DNA as a woman. You are not a man, you don't have a Y chromosome. And you need to live in alignment to that and all the choices leading up to that for hundreds of thousands of years to live well, from eating to working out, women should lift weights, I think it's very healthy for you. So I say thin, but really what I mean is health. You should be healthy and you should be fit and you should pursue that your entire life. And women in this country are not that. Other countries, it's a little bit different. Poland, way, way fitter and way healthier. But in America, it's a serious problem, and particularly for women. So eat a good diet the rest of your life, have a good time, live healthy, be well. We've got to make women pregnant again. Fertility is going way downhill, right? Women eat like crap, you eat McDonald's, your fertility goes out the window. You wait to have your first kid at like 39 years old, your eggs are almost all gone by that point. 98, 99% of your eggs are dead by your late 30s. By age 30, 90% of your eggs are dead. Young girls, they have no idea about any of this stuff. So we've got to make women pregnant again. Women got to get wifed up, they got to get knocked up as young as they can. White women in particular have done really, I think they're in last place. So white girls, y'all watching, shame on you. Last place, loser shit. Get in first place with that. You know, the other girls, they get wife, they get knocked up. White girls, they're not making enough babies. So white girls get knocked up, quit being lazy. <sighs> this is actually a tweet from Elon Musk, you know, just a few months ago, or actually from 2020. But he's talked about this a couple times over. Elon Musk said recently, billionaire, if you guys don't know him, almost everyone does, Population collapse is second biggest danger to civilization after AI, in my opinion. I think he's right. I'm not so sure about the AI thing. That's more his deal. But this overpopulation, feminist, globalist garbage, this is all this wild conspiracy theory. It's nonsense. Fertility and births and all this stuff are dropping off a cliff. It's bad. It's bad for everyone. Make as many babies as you can. Have unlimited babies. Get wiped up, knocked up, young. Have a good time. Build a family. None of this overpopulation... I'm gonna have one kid or just two, no, three, four, five, six, seven kids. Michael Foster, seven kids. They even had an eighth, but unfortunately she died uh, right at the last minute, like stillbirth. But anyway, I have a bunch of kids. I came from a big family, I'm very happy I did. And I think most people who do are much more well-balanced. I'm sure that's amusing, given what I do. But I love growing up in a big family, I hope to make a huge one myself. And that is the plan, I'm gonna do that, lead by example. So have babies, make women pregnant again. We gotta make them infertile again, very similar, and that comes from health. None of this egg freezing garbage, I'm gonna unfreeze my eggs, I'm gonna live free, eat, pray, love, eat, pray, slut, all this dumb garbage, no. Be healthy, pursue health, eat well, live well, get good sleep, lift weights, go for a walk, you manage your stress, and you know, have sex and get married young. Get wifed up young, not at 38, 18, 20, 25, whatever, young. So pursue, you know, respect your fertility that it falls off a cliff by age 30. Head in this direction, pursue health, and you'll get fertility. In my view, non-medical opinion, uh, this will come kind of automatically. We gotta make women female again. I can't believe I even have to say that or anyone has to say that. This is a real thing and you're gonna see why. This is Christina Aguilera with her giant green dildo. Now, when I was growing up in the 90s and 2000s, she was like this rival of Britney Spears. Well, Britney Spears is her own fucking huge mess. But this is her old like best buddy or rival or whatever. And this to me, I know this is she's a celebrity and they want attention and like all this kind of stuff. So this is a this is an extreme example, but I think it's still a good example because it's a micro expression of the American female. Big green Hulk monster with a big green dick. I mean, the envy is literally the penis envy is literally green. This is where American women are at, and it's a celebrity, and it's a you know, really high-profile example, but how far off is the American woman from that? 
I'm a boss bitch, boss queen, hashtag queen life, all this garbage. This is what women do now, not just for attention. They like want to be men. It's disgusting. Don't be a man. Don't put on a giant green dildo. You don't need it. It's not going to make your life better. It's disgusting. It's sick. This kind of crap has to stop. And even though your average Tinder girl is not walking around in a big green Hulk monster suit with a big green dildo, this is not that far off from how women operate today. They act like men. And then at the high end of it, you get this kind of bizarre stuff for attention. This has to stop. We got to make women wives again. Elliot Hulse, one of our speakers, he gave a whole speech on this back in 2020. Uh, he spoke also at the event earlier on yesterday. So you can go on YouTube or 20 University and search Make Women Wives Again. He gave an entire speech on that. Hmm? Oh. Now we're good. Yeah, he'll let me know. Anyway, we got to make women wives again. None of this single life shit forever and ever and ever. Get wifed up, get knocked up young. We're good? Yeah. Make women wives again. Make women submissive again. So this is a big trigger word. A lot of people get really upset. Lori Alexander is an author and a blogger I know. You guys might know her from The Transform Wife. One of her memes actually inspired Make Women Great Again, uh, that men prefer debt-free virgins without tattoos, which is obviously true, but you know, irritates people to no end. She talks a lot about submission for women, and from a female perspective, I recommend you look into Lori Alexander and her work with The Transform Wife. She's also like hyper-Christian, which I think is pretty cool. I'm not, but it's interesting. So with submission, I'll give you a little example. One of my sisters, a couple years ago, she was getting in a fight with her boyfriend about some stuff. They'd been dating for a couple of years. And he wanted her to do something, and she didn't want to do it. And I was like, well, are you, you know, do you respect him? Do you submit to his authority in your relationship? Is he your leader? And she's like, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm like, well, guess what? You need to do what he tells I don't agree with what he's doing either but you need to do it. If you just do what this guy tells you when you feel like it, that's not submission. That's not you, you know, being a woman and embracing that. That's just bullshit you're telling yourself. If you only submit when you just feel like it, and you're in a good mood and we're all this garbage, no, that's nonsense. You need to do it even when you disagree. Elliot and his wife talked about this as well last year at this event. Uh, and you know, you guys can watch the video, it's got millions of views. She does what he wants him to do, what her to do, excuse me, even when she disagrees, and they go into the reasons why that is. One of them is so he can learn, right? As a leader, he needs to learn how to lead his family. That means make choices, right or wrong. And then those responsibility and authority, it's got to stick with him. So real submission is submitting basically all the time, right? Don't get hit by a car in the process. Anything short of putting yourself in imminent danger, if you consider your boyfriend, your husband, your leader, you need to follow his lead, especially when you disagree, because that's the test. And if that test hits you and you're just like, no, I'm going to do what I want. No, you're not submissive and you're not submitting to him and it's bullshit. You're just doing it when you feel like it and when, it, when you happen to agree with it. That's not real. It's not authentic. If you want to be a good woman, you need to be submissive, including when you disagree. We need to make patriarchy great again. You know, as you know, feminists smash the patriarchy to a thousand pieces or a million pieces. This is this ongoing thing, right? In my view, it's very obvious to me we live in a matriarchy. Every time there's a presidential election, all we hear is it's her turn, right? With Kamala now, we have a VP who's a chick, which is beyond disgraceful in my view to our founding fathers and the way our country was founded. But every time we hear that kind of stuff with politics and you hear it throughout culture, right? It's a woman's world, boss queen, you know, girls, all this bullshit. We need to rebuild the patriarchy. Patriarchy is good for families. It is good for women. It is good for everyone. And patriarchy to me is this masculine leadership, particularly in a family. Right? None of this co-equal, we're going to like be partners. I, I hate this. Nothing irritates me more than when a husband or a wife calls their, you know, their husband or wife a partner. No, you're not partners. They're your husband or they're your wife. This partner stuff is like a, was this a business arrangement. Or do you guys have like a three-way like partnership with your business? This is stupid. So we need to make patriarchy great again. Men need to lead and women need to follow. This is a choice you have to make. It's not automatic. You're a human being. You have free will. You have to act on it. I have to live in accordance to it. And that means following the leadership of men that you choose. Hopefully you choose a good one, or your parents help you choose a good one, or your friends and your family and stuff like that. Fundamentally, though, patriarchy is good. We're rebuilding it brick by brick, bit by bit at the Patriarch Convention. One view at a time, one million views at a time, which is going pretty well. 
So make patriarchy great again. It is not evil. It is not bad. But it's all nonsense that they taught you about this stuff. We've got to make women classy again. One of the things I noticed about when I went to Poland, everywhere you went, women dressed really well, really, really well. Like I was stunned. Even in the airport, you know, in America, you go to the airport, big airport, Orlando, Miami, Chicago, girls will walk around like in sweatpants or eating like McDonald's fries and shit. You can like smell it literally. Actually, I would give you that example because I came back from Poland after the convention. I went to another city to tour it uh, for a future 21 convention. Came back a couple weeks later. The women in the Poland airport were dressed like girls in America would be going out to a club even better in some ways, more classy, a little bit more covered up, nice shit. They understood how to dress. I get back to America. These girls are all just like sweating and they're like sweat, you know, these hoodies and shit and like yoga pants and literally smells like McDonald's everywhere. I wasn't even near a McDonald's or a Burger King or anything in the airport. It just smelled like it. I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> On one hand, I was disgusted. And then I was like, but these are my country women. I want them to do well. God, they smell like McDonald's. This is gross. And they look like garbage. But they need to do better. Just dress better, right? The way you look is important. It's the first thing anyone's, and particularly for women, right? It's even more, I think, than for men. But the first thing people see about you is the way you look, your appearance. Take care of yourself, take care of your health, work out, eat healthy, and dress well, you know, put some effort into it. You know, if you wear yoga pants at home or, or yoga class, whatever, you know, wearing yoga pants to like church or something, this is just like ridiculous, this shit has to stop. Dress better, be classy, take care of yourself. Don't be an OnlyFans girl, you know, or, or TikTok, TikTok thought, tick thought. That's a coach Red calls them, tick thoughts. Yeah, so be classy again, dress well, look well. We gotta make voting great again. This is my new initiative this year. Uh, I wasn't always like this, but now I'm like, you know what? I'm taking this route. I think this is what we need. So I'm not opposed necessarily to women voting. Obviously this is a constitutional amendment. I don't think there's any leeway at all for that to ever change. It's not possible or it's so, so far unlikely. It's just kind of irrelevant. But as far, I made it a commitment earlier this year on Twitter and then I posted on Instagram. I got banned on Instagram temporarily for it. But I said, I'm never voting for a woman again anywhere. And the only exception ever I would ever make is from Melissa Isaac, who just spoke here earlier today, ever. I told her that like a year ago. So I'm done voting for women. If you want to vote, that's do your thing. That's your right, right? Legally, at least, and politically. But as far as voting for a woman candidate, primaries, general election, I'm done. If there's a, if it's, you know, man versus woman, I'm either voting for the man or not voting at all, period, every time. If it's two women running in like a primary race or even a general, not voting. I did this earlier this year for the Florida primaries and because I'm done. General elections coming up, same thing. I'm done voting for women. I do not believe under any circumstances women belong in government, leading governments, particularly like a presidency, a vice presidency, a governor, governorship, anything like that, but anything, I'm just done. School board, mayor, you know, state congressman, senator, whatever, I don't care, I'm done. It's not normal for thousands and thousands of years of government, civilized history. I think our founding fathers would find it appalling. It is bizarre and women shouldn't run. That doesn't mean they can't run. I'm not, I'm not advocating for laws to stop them from doing that. They should voluntarily not do it. My grandma never voted, would ever do that. She even, people find this amusing. I'll tell you guys, uh, after my grandfather died, she had actually would, she would still vote, but she would call my uncle and ask him who to vote for. She would only, because he was the oldest uh, male in the family after that point when my grandpa died. I think my grandpa, my, my grandpa right now is like 86 years old. I'm 34 by comparison, right? So he was much older than me. So anyway, she would only vote how he instructed her to or not vote at all. And that's not the exact same situation here, but fundamentally it's, it reminds me of that. Women should not run for government. You should not operate the government. You should not lead it. And now I want to mention too a presidency aspect because Ayn Rand, one of my favorite philosopher years ago, she was in Phil Donahue like in the late 70s. And they asked her on this big TV show about voting for a woman president, would you ever vote for one? And she was like, no. And they got really upset and all this stuff. They even asked her, like, what if a woman was better qualified than a man? Ayn Rand said to Phil Donahue, well, if it had fallen that low, I might. And the women were like, aghast. You could hear them like, <gasps> it's, it's actually on YouTube, you should go watch it. But she actually explains a little bit more of a theory on why this is, particularly the presidency, because at the time she would still vote for women running for government and other offices congressmen, senators, stuff like that. The presidency in particular, in our country anyway, in America, of our federal government, the president is the commander in chief of the military. 
And in Iran's view, you know, she was born in the Soviet Union, she fled to America to flee communism and stuff. This was just insane to her, that you would put a woman in charge of men at this profound level of an entire military, not just even a particular branch, the whole thing, the nukes, the military, the Air Force, everything. That to me is just crazy. There's no point in human history up till extremely recently, with the exception of Queens, right, the divine right of all this stuff, but this is not normal. I think our founding fathers are not supported at all, so I'm just done. I'm not voting for woman ever again. Ever, 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 unless Melissa runs. Then we'll consider it. We'll see. I already got this one. Not sure why this is up here. Mistake. So make women great again. That's my speech. I appreciate you guys tuning into the speech. If you ask me questions, I'll take it. But that's my brief, you know, comprehensive overview of what Make Women Great Again is, what it's about, and what needs to happen for American women in this country. Thank you. If there's any questions, I'll take some. Otherwise, I will gladly take a break. Looks like we got one there. Okay. Um, I think it's very interesting, the points that you made about um, voting. Um, I think after the election and, you know, I, I'm also from another country, so I can kind of, you know, look at what's going on in a, um, at a greater sense. And it's not just in America. There's a lot of voting issues in a lot of different countries. And now that we're on digital machines, you know, um, how are these auditable if you don't have a paper trail at all? There's some countries where they have no paper trail. It's just digital. So I'm, not, I'm also not saying, I mean, I think it would be easy to restrict voting to get rid of this fraud and all this nonsense that is happening. And I don't understand why people aren't talking about it. You know, we had that whole investigation and there's a lot of other investigations in a lot of different countries that are going on. Why is nobody talking about these issues with digital? You know, it, it's a huge problem. And um, if I can comment on your on what you're saying here, I think the average person is basically asleep. It's a, basically it's a sheep. I mean, that's it. Sometimes it's easy to say like a ton of people are stupid. Think about how stupid the average person is. Like comedians have said stuff like that. Stand-up comedians. But I don't really think the IQ or stupidity is much of the issue. It's people are just asleep. They sleepwalk through their whole life. I mean, not just the politics and government and their country and whatever, it's everything. They get fat, they get or sleep, they just do what they're told, they're obedient in all the wrong ways, right? They're not obedient to some husband that loves them or whatever you wanna call it in some family. They're obedient to a boss who doesn't care about them or some woke corporation that's just gonna fire them as soon as they can automate their job. So yeah, people are just asleep. I mean, first of all, that's how I look at it with voting or anything else. They just totally tune out to everything in the world around them. I, I don't know how we can start start talking to people of, about the this issue. I mean, back in the day, it used to be you could only vote if you were male and you owned land, right? Yeah. I mean, and you you were responsible to the draft if you know. Yeah. I don't understand why it's such a problem for you to look at it from a logical perspective. You know, people who vote are people who will be drafted. So in my, my understanding of American history anyway, early voting not only was attached to these certain conditions, some of which are racial, which I'm glad those are gone. That's fundamentally good. But voting fundamentally back in the early parts of our country's history, it was not considered a right. Not in that you don't have the right to do it. It would have been bizarre to them if you told them it was a right to anyone, even, guy, even men who were voting at the time, right? White landowners, whatever. It didn't exist like that. Voting was seen more as like a jury duty. It was like an administrative duty that you had to go out and do that was kind of a pain in the ass, but you did it anyway. Kind of like jury duty today. At some point along the way, late 1800s and early 1900s, this changed. Voting became a right. It's a right. I mean, look at today, the, the, the propaganda for it's insane. Use your right, go vote. Duh, 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 duh. This is not, for a lot of American history, this is not the case. People just didn't, didn't care, they weren't involved. And it was, it was seen as more sacred. So the idea, our modern conception of voting being some individual unalienable right, like your right to life, to own property, to defend yourself, to pursue happiness. Voting was not seen with that. You know, it's not in the Declaration of Independence, right? The right to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, and voting. Voting is not in there. Never was, not even as a potential. So that, that's a huge propaganda battle. I don't have an easy answer for it, but 
that was a pretty recent change in history. And I don't think it's a right. I think it should be limited, maybe not to landowning, but like, even if we limited, vote, limited voting to just taxpayers, or even tax filers, even if you didn't pay a single dollar in taxes, this would radically alter voting demographics in the United States. Much as you know, women got the right to vote, or the ability to vote, this changed everything. So you don't think it's possible to have that conversation at all? I mean, I, I, I can understand that every time that I try to talk to anybody about this, even in my personal life, it's just, it's hysteria, hysteria, hysteria. Yeah, this yeah. is a right, this is a right. No, it's not. It, it really, historically, it isn't. But, um, you know, it, it's so difficult. Um, so one of my favorite speakers that I've invited here a couple times, but the vax mandates and stuff keep blocking it, is Professor Janice Fimengo, a woman who's been on my channel many times. I think an incredibly powerful speaker for women and against feminism and for men. And she talked to my channel one time when I was interviewing her on the Red Man Group. She's talking about how the West probably isn't going to survive uh, decadency. And this is a word you don't hear used that often, decadent, right? Maybe in a movie or something. But I thought about what she said and I was like, that's a really good point. We are so wealthy in America and then you know our, our allied nations, Canada, Britain, the UK, uh, Australia and stuff. We have so much wealth and we're on so much power left over from like World War II and all the power changes that happened ge uh, geopolitically then. Yeah, I mean, it, it might be the fall of Rome in the near future, next couple of decades or whatever. I don't know. No one really knows for certain on that. Everyone has an opinion, right? Some, every conspiracy theorist is like, it's coming any minute. Buy my fucking vitamins right now. <laughs> buy my food bucket. The only of mine, my toothpaste. You got to buy my toothpaste. Maybe we will and maybe, you know, it'll be a, like a... With balkanization. Maybe it'll be a kind of like a Soviet Union collapse and we'll have different countries. Maybe it'll stick together and we'll hold together. Able to be this big renewal of masculinity and femininity and family. And then through that, politics lives downstream from culture. Maybe that'll change. That's why I do what I do with these conventions and this whole everything into 21 studios. You know, it's not just politics, it's the culture that changes everything. And politically today, these issues are not, none of them really give a shit. Conservatives will give you a little bit of lip service about like family and a little bit of masculinity now and stuff, but it's all, it's all fake. 99% of it's fake. They don't give a crap about masculinity, they don't give a crap about family, they don't give a crap about fatherhood. You know, they're basically all feminists. All 90, I would say 90% of conservatives today, in the Republican Party or otherwise, right, that vote, they, all their views and almost all their views would have been considered radical feminism 20 years ago, 25 years ago. These people just lose and apologize and adopt everything that their political opponents do. I mean, so yeah, it's thinking about that though, that especially the conservative women, I call them conservative sluts, conservative skanks, these fake conservative women, they just, they're all basically just radical feminists. I find it appalling. You know, they consider themselves traditionally conservative. So like, you're a radical feminist from like 1994. Get the fuck out of here. Anyway, I don't interrupt you too much. Thank you. Oh, uh, you have a question? Oh, here she goes. Not necessarily a question. Um, but on the voting, I understand your grandmother because my husband tells me how to vote so that we have two votes. And, and I never, ever would vote against what he said, which is part of the submission thing, yeah. which means that our example as women for submission in the Bible is Sarah and her husband tried to give her to Pharaoh. Now, she didn't follow up on that, and when it came down, push came down to shove, she did tell Pharaoh that she was already married to Abraham, and Abraham got in a little trouble about it. So, um, but read it, it's in Genesis. Thank you. Question, last one, Aaron. Yes, thank you. So it seems to me that um, most, both girls and um, girls would learn in their household uh, how the example of a feminine and submissive woman from their mother, ideally, um, but also fathers play a huge role in teaching a daughter how to take correction yes. and be submissive. And fathers also play a huge role in teaching sons how to lead and give correction. So I just wonder your thoughts on, um, I guess, the state of teaching children, um, both leadership and followership, considering that so many kids are getting raised in fatherless homes currently. Can you be a little bit more specific? 
Like, like do you want me to comment on the fatherlessness situation, the tidal wave of single motherhood? Um, I'm curious about how we fill in the gap. You know, how do we, mm. how do we even teach young girls, right? Yeah. I'm just taking uh, from the position of my perspective as if I'm gonna take full personal responsibility for the role I play in the hierarchy of women, mm. right? How do I support young girls to mm. learn how to be submissive when they're taking, they're being raised by masculine women who are trying to be both their mom and their dad yeah. in single mother homes a lot of the time. The situation is not good. So I, I think I understand what you're kind of asking and getting at. There, like I mentioned a minute ago, just kind of uh, casually, there is a tidal wave of single motherhood and fatherlessness, fatherlessness in this country, particularly with black Americans, but also whites and Hispanics. Asians are doing significantly better, but even that's gone through the roof. Single motherhood in this country 100 years ago, I think was like 2%. It was like, it was like a single digit percent, it was super low. In the black community in America, I think it's around 70, and whiteness and Hispanics are in the 40s, it's huge. This is a serious problem, because this is kind of a one-way street when you have broken homes and broken families. And the Richard Grandin spoke to you guys yesterday, he would call it, he would call it intergenerational trauma. It's like a snowball going down a hill. So it's not good. And that I think also feeds into or alongside the decadency I was talking about a minute ago. So there's multiple, there are catastrophic problems facing our country and, and even beyond America, Western civilization that are coalescing. And even in the most aware elements of political culture today, the things that I even support and like, they're just like clueless to this stuff or they're only vaguely aware of it. Uh, as a positive counterexample, though, in, in Florida earlier this year, our governor, he uh, put together, and they, they signed into law with the Lincoln legislators, a like $100 million or so fatherhood fund for fathers in Florida. So that was a good step in the right direction to kind of actually facilitate what you're saying and support fathers being fathers and support all these kids who don't have you know, fathers around and stuff. It's a bad situation, basically. And I don't know if there's, there's definitely no guaranteed way out of it. I mean, anyone promising you some guaranteed path out of this, like, this giant tidal wave of single mothers, they're lying to you. This is a big problem. The single mothers, as we most of you probably know, they're the worst parents in America. That's a fact, not an opinion. They raise the worst children. Not single fathers, which also, that's not good. It's single mothers. Their children come out really super screwed up. Uh, you, know, divorce pro you know, divorce rates in the future, drug problems, prison problems, violence, uh, all behavioral learning disorders. Like it's, it's amazing how bad it is. So it's not an easy problem to fix. The one hope that I have, I think the Manosphere, which is this event, this event and the others and the whole 21 Studios and all the speakers you see here too, with their own content and their own channels. I think the Manosphere is the most important movement alive in America today and in the West. Because it's the only thing, in my view and my understanding of all this, and I track this shit like a hawk, that's doing anything at serious scales to push back against feminism and all this dogma and this propaganda that they fed. We live in a feminist culture. Everything's feminist. The government's feminist, your state government's feminist, the federal government's feminist. The FBI is feminist, the, the military is feminist, the church is feminist, the school is feminist, the high school is feminist, the college is feminist, Walmart's feminist. Everything's fucking feminist all the time, literally all of it. They have dominated culture with this toxic garbage to such an astounding degree that we're like fish in water, we're not even aware of it. But the manosphere is the one thing pushing back against that tooth and nail. I think that there's even government agencies like Homeland Security and stuff that have been investigating the manus for now, and they want to, I think they want to basically demonize it and, you know, just vilify it basically, because it's a threat. It's a threat culturally and peacefully against all this garbage that's causing all these problems with single motherhood and fatherlessness and all this stuff. That's the only thing I see today. There's, that, there's not even, there's no more cigar bars, right? Your church is all woke and feminist, your schools are feminist, the government's feminist. Even the Boy Scouts, they don't even exist anymore. I was growing up in the 90s, there was Boy Scouts. Now there's no Boy Scouts. They're just the scouts. They're even getting sued by the Girl Scouts, I think. That's how, that's how retarded our culture has become. The Girl Scouts are suing the former Boy Scouts, which basically got a vasectomy or something, or a, you know, the SNP. They're no longer, it's no longer the Boy Scouts. They've castrated the Boy Scouts, right? This shit's falling apart. But the manosphere I have a lot of hope for, that's something that's been a part of my life since I was 17 years old. I love it. I think it's fundamentally a positive force, even if it's not perfect. And I'm doing everything I can to make it better and to make it stronger and more powerful and actually have a huge impact on culture and shift the course of American history, which is extremely hard. I, mean, I think people underestimate that because everything, everyone's going to change the world with like a, a PayPal account or a YouTube channel. It's not that easy. 
you need the amount of impact and influence and views. Like my friend Cobra Tate, Andrew Tate, you guys probably saw that recently blow up, right? He blew up to such an astounding degree, he was actually moving the needle on young boys in America and in the West. They axed him. Big tech, billionaires had a hissy fit, bitch fit. Instagram, YouTube, Stripe, PayPal, newsletters, hosting. I mean, he got his banks were canceling him. It's crazy. Because this is the amount, that's the amount of, he got uh, 12 billion views in a few months on TikTok and like another billion on YouTube and all this stuff. You need views. My channel is doing crazy. Like we're having a huge impact. We've done 19 million views in the past 30 days. That's amazing for me as an entrepreneur. I'm very proud of it. But I want that number to be 190 million. I want it to be a billion like Tate ad because that's what you actually need to influence people. Words are the most powerful weapon in the world. That's why this huge battle of a free speech, it keeps getting more and more intense. Because if they could control the language, they control the information. If they control the information that you have access to, your eyes and your ears and your brain, they control you, you're a slave, and you don't even know it. If someone censored me successfully on the internet, you would never get marketing information from me or videos or anything. You literally wouldn't be in this room right now. You'd have no idea the event even exists because they would be controlling you in ways you don't even see. That's how real propaganda works and real influence. And these people pushing this crap, they're going for it a thousand miles an hour. So I think the manosphere is the only thing that can really you know, facilitate what you're talking about, make a huge impact. And that's why I fight for it every day in my life. Thank you. And rant. Thank you. to Good Morning Britain. We are finding out how men can make women great again because uh, in Orlando, Florida, is a man charging almost a thousand dollars. Anthony Dream Johnson, who says he wants to abolish feminism and make women great again. In Orlando, Florida, that's going to be the scene of the crime. 21 studios, okay? They are pretty much the Avengers of the Manosphere. First and foremost, shout out to 21 Studios. So this convention is put on by a company called 21 Studios, and they have this whole convention every year called the 21 one convention where it's just teaching men how to be better. Women are queuing up to pay nearly a thousand dollars to have a man like Anthony tell them how to be women. It's mansplaining palooza. Anthony Dream Johnson, that's really his name, but he's the founder of the convention. Like yourself and like Anthony Johnson, the president. The first president of the manosphere. President of the manosphere. You're protecting the sphere in a way that not enough people give you credit for. Thanks, man. And I really mean that, because if you didn't protect the sphere at all, it would just be a complete shit show. That's why you're the president, right? <laughs> you gotta be presidential. You gotta be presidential. Oh, yes. And that guy's name was Anthony the Dream Johnson, the president of the f***ing manosphere. There's only one guy in the manosphere. Yeah, you're a peach, uh, Mr. President. You're f***ing done, dude. That's all there is to it. Uh, all in favor, say aye. Excuse me, I'm mansplaining here.